Good evening, everyone, again, and greetings. Welcome to tonight's presidential address and awards ceremony. I'm Trevor Perry Giles, your executive director and your host for this evening. Before we begin tonight's program, I would ask that we pause for a moment of reflection. All of us at NCA and those of us gathered here today recognize and acknowledge that we are gathered on the lands and unceded land of the Piscataway peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the US federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. We ask you to join us in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. NCA also acknowledges that it has often gathered upon unceded lands and that those gatherings manifested the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities via slavery and via racist laws that segregated all peoples into binary classifications of white and black. This acknowledgement demonstrates our commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you NCA's 105th president, Dr. Star Muir. Now the story is told that for years in the middle part of the last century, NCA presidents did not present a presidential address at the national conference. Eager to revive the practice in anticipation of her own upcoming presidency, Marie Hockmuth Nichols renewed the presidential address in 1968 and compelled a reluctant Douglas Enninger to present one at the Chicago Convention. In her own address in 1969, Nicholas Nichols opined on the tyranny of relevance as she wondered, but we need to ask ourselves whether or not the idea of relevance has not taken on more sinister aspects in our time, whether it has not become a bullying slogan, allied with power, designed to stop thought, as slogans frequently do, whether it fosters unreason instead of reason, whether under it the freedom of the teacher to teach and the student to learn are not threatened, whether under it also the curriculum is about to become a patchwork, not a unified system of teaching based on a philosophy of education. Now, based on the title and abstract of his address, The Coming Dark Age and the Future of Scholarly Associations, I suspect that Star Muir will have something, something to say this evening about the role and nature of relevance of communication and NCA some 50 years following Nichols's ruminations, and will undoubted, undoubtedly be the better for Star's insights and commentary. Now, you all know Star Muir is an associate professor of communication at George Mason University. Dr. Muir received his PhD in rhetoric and communication from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's degree in communication from the University of Central Florida, and a bachelor's degree in communication from Wake Forest University. His research has focused on the impact of digital communication, and he has published in Philosophy and Rhetoric, Communication Teacher, Journal of Modern Applied Statistical Methods, and elsewhere. Star's work on the distance delivery of video modules won several communicator and tele awards for educational programming, and Star was the 2018 recipient of George Mason's University's David J. King Award for career contributions to teaching and learning. What you may not know about Star is his incredible and indelible generosity as a leader of NCA. Star has been generous with his time, ever present to answer a question, offer an opinion, to craft an argument. Star has been generous with his ego, constantly pursuing initiatives and efforts for the benefit of NCA and NCA alone, never once placing his own interests or his own aggrandizement above those of the association. And Star has been generous with his patience. He has endured some harsh and personal invective this past year, and he's endured it with grace, good humor, and an infinite generosity of spirit. And for this tremendous generosity, all of us at NCA owe Star Muir our deepest admiration and our most sincere gratitude. And another thing you may not know about Star, his middle name is Aldebaran. 
which is the name of an actual star. So please join me in welcoming for his presidential address NCA's 105th president, Dr. Star Aldebaran Muir. Thank you, Trevor. That was both kind and deft. NCA truly benefits from both your skill sets and your caring heart, so thank you. First, I want to thank my mentors who have influenced me over my lifetime very greatly. Kathy Kellerman, Alan Loudon, Bill Noonan, Anita Taylor, and Dom Boileau. I'm also thankful that my family managed to make the journey, that my children, uh, Caitlin and Alex, are here to watch. And of course, I want to give extreme amounts of gratitude to my partner and my mentor and the love of my life, Jeanette Kenner Muir. <clears throat> Introduction. By way of an innocently pentatic structure, several evocative modes, and certain freedoms except for time, we come to this focus. What can our scholarly associations, and NCA and NCA members in particular, do to help society realize the promise of knowledge and education in overcoming aspects of our technology now undermining the human project so that we may all strive together to address the critical problems of our time? Let me start the fun at one in the light, in the educational purpose of our association. Most members of our association, I believe, share an underlying value that education is truly a foundation for people growing and actualizing their lives. For me, whether through research or teaching, learning is a joyful part of what we do. Not all students might agree, but this is the light of our culture the transmission of knowledge and experience, memories of our lessons enriching the discussions of following generations, cultivation of thoughtful and open discussion of difficult issues, resistance to simplistic characterizations and chaotic distractions, skills for managing communication, time, and attention. This is how we prepare people to think critically, communicate well, work with others, and address the local and global problems that we all face. But even as we bask in this light, we must look around and consider the darkening of our days. The poetic mode serves as a transition to some darker musings. The New Dark Ages by Chase Twitchell. Thunderstorms stir me up. The stillness right before the first close tremor. The pond shivering at the height of summer. The field full blown going to seed. But this storm scares me. A foreign climate occupies the land. When nature was God in my childhood, I wasn't afraid. Snow buried the town, the river flooded it, lightning set the woods on fire. In months, the damage bandaged itself with mosses and ferns. This storm comes from another world, here by mistake, its rain blistering the birch leaves. Has it been weaponized? No one knows what to expect of a storm with human parents. In my news feeds and my communities, I see much to be concerned about. Publics are divided and hostile. Polarization and conflict are evident through many countries across the world. Populism and racial and ethnic violence are both more prevalent and more open. Centralized and authoritarian governments and forces are strengthening, while democratic nations and alliances are under attack in ways that reduce their effectiveness and their credibility. Journalists and press freedoms are under siege, and disinformation and unaccountable extreme online political information are undermining trust in the media environment. Meanwhile, Popeye's chicken sandwich is trending on Twitter. Over 165 million follow Ariana Grande on Instagram, and the buzz says you simply must check out the second season of Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan in case you had a surge of FOMO, fear of missing out. 
If I were asked the question now, are we headed to a new dark age, I might have to answer, how would we know? James Bridle's recent work on the new dark age sees the darkness in a wide variety of technologies impacts, computational thinking and automated decision making, an increasing systemic complexity constructed opaquely in fostering inequality, violence, populism, and fundamentalism, governmental and corporate complicity in creating secrecy and mistrust, along with citizen complicity in the surveillance state, and of course rising climate chaos among other factors. For Bridal, the promise of an abundance of information and a plurality of viewpoints has not yielded a coherent consensus reality, but instead has fostered fundamentalist preferences for, quote, simplistic narratives, conspiracy theories, and post-factual politics. In her book, Distraction, The Erosion of Attention and the Coming Dark Age, Maggie Jackson is more focused on the loss of our attentiveness and the impact this is having on our relationships, our capacity for deep reflection, and our cultural memory. The ability of a society or culture to remember the lessons of history has direct impact on its capacity to respond to cultural and environmental threats. A dark age, she argues, is a turning point in history when despite a flux in innovation, there is a collective forgetting and a decline in civilization. This brings us to the centrality of attention. Attention is an interlocking set of three networks, Jackson explains. Awareness, known as alerting, focus, the selection of relevant information, and planning, executive attention and control. Our attentional system, she argues, must develop executive attention and control as that determines our growth as individuals, drives our willpower, and enables reflective thinking and deep learning. In their work on the distracted mind, ancient brains in a high-tech world, Adam Ghazali and Larry Rosen offer solid research about the relationship between attention, working memory, and goal management. They note three game changers, the internet, social media, and smartphones that have dramatically increased interference behaviors well beyond television and radio, reducing human control, overloading working memory, and inhibiting goal management. Smartphones are now estimated at 3.3 billion worldwide, or about 42.6% of humanity. Checking our phone every 15 minutes, Sleeping with the phone nearby and checking within 15 minutes of waking up, that's 80% of smartphone users. Moving on if a video takes more than two seconds to load. Or concurrently using multiple devices. One UK study of 200 people watching one hour of television revealed an average of 21 device switches. Tablet, laptop, phone, all while watching television. These are all indicators of a culture of continuous partial attention. But we know this. Most of us have experience noting behavior changes in our students, attending device and distraction challenged meetings, living an unfolding media spectacle with distractions of fake news, sound bites, memes, and multiple crawl lines, and experiencing ourselves the difficulties of finding focus or those precious moments of flow. in narrative mode. I grew up in the counterculture, living on a bus, traveling around the United States and Mexico, spending lots of time in nature. The smell of sagebrush after the rain. We had no TV or media except for books. The success of my father's book on how to keep your Volkswagen alive enabled me to attend college. <clears throat> But my technologies for debate research were the card catalog, which my children are still skeptical that such a thing could ever have existed, <laughs> and the ditto machine, which brought more purple into my life, including on my face when I first met my amazing wife. Now, raised on books and nature, having resisted technology and devices as long as possible, my confession here today is that I, too, flicker. I am challenged and I struggle with distraction, and this lived experience is partly responsible for my concern here today. 
The impacts of distraction on health productivity and learning, researchers note, are staggering. 18% of U.S. automobile accidents, five to 600 billion lost in annual workplace productivity, changing relationships with 25% of Americans revealing they have no close confidant, and that number is double what it was in 1988. And of course, uh, mental health challenges are increasing with rates of ADHD and teen suicides right now at record levels. Like climate change, Susan Greenfield writes, mind change, the impact of our new media technologies on cognition, perception, and motivation is, quote, global, controversial, unprecedented, and multifaceted. When we live a distracted life, we lose the capacity to create wisdom, even amid an abundance of information and connection. Now, <clears throat> A brief illustrative amusement using self-reflexive sentences in the ironic mode. A tale of distraction conceptually indebted to Douglas Hofstadter. This first sentence is alive and glows with its premier importance. First out of the keyboard, post that on Facebook, but sadly fails in its sole task of creating a clear opening theme. This second sentence, hastening because Fortnite, shuts itself down quick. This sentence, with dedicated focus and executive control, will help humanity solve the problems of its... Oh, wait! A cat video! Oh! Can we please, please, can we, shall we? No. This paragraph is finished. Agree with me, this is three, and let us turn briefly to another perplexing area of technological concern, the impoverishment of discourse and the fragmentation of the American public. The impact of new media technologies and devices is varied and at times contradictory. Some social causes have gained numbers and traction using social media, but a recent report notes that 89% of the world's internet users are actively monitored, with China leading the way, but 39 other countries funding advanced social media surveillance programs. Domestically, internet freedom dropped in the US for the third straight year, primarily from surveillance and disinformation campaigns. Recent work on Twitter and the bully pulpit, along with expanding scholarship on tensions and contradictions within social media, reflect growing concern in our discipline about the nature and resilience of a public voice. Three specific dislocations concern me as they undermine assumptions about a robust democracy. The simplification of complexity, the polarization of discourse, and the fragmentation of public power. Now, an exercise or experiment, if you will, in distraction via mimetic and metonymic modes. That's imitation, and reduction. In 1988, Kathleen Jameson's eloquence in an electronic age spoke convincingly of the loss of argument and evidence in soundbite culture. Since then, we've had the emergence of the internet, social media, and mobile devices, all of which have contributed to user preference for short bursts of information. Nicholas Carr wonders if Google is making us stupid and speaks of the death of the book and shares Jackson's concern that a culture of distraction, the juggler's brain, impedes our ability to sustain deep reflection and address complex problems. In politics, memes are trenchant, satirical, divisive, and dominant visual discourse. I enjoy an occasional meme myself, taken in moderation, of course, but they are no substitute for actual discussion and there is a simple maxim worth remembering. Most simplicity deceives. How did that experiment work out for you all? This simplification, coupled with the anonymity of most electronic exchanges, also relates to the second issue of polarization and the evolution in tone for much of the political discourse on the internet and social media. Simplistic essentialism lacking accountability shifts interactions ad hominem toward derision, 
ridicule, intimidation, and hostility, communications framed in seemingly perpetual bipolar antagonism. A recent Hewlett Foundation report concludes that active producers of disinformation, including trolls, bots, fake news websites, politicians, highly partisan media outlets, and foreign governments, result in polarization and intense elite and mass partisanship, further generating hostility and extreme tactics that undermine compromise and political engagement. My final political concern is the fragmentation of public power. Jill Eady and Patrick Merrick, in their recent work on A Nation Fragmented, the Public Agenda in the Information Age, analyzed Gallup poll information to determine measures of public agenda diversity, the number of issues, the strength of support, et cetera. They conclude that the public agenda has become increasingly fragmented, more of a series of different competing publics, which opens the door for manipulation by special interests. In this environment, Power emerges not democratically, but by, quote, leveraging the vacuum created by divisions within the public, distracting the public, and enabling leaders to pursue their own agendas without regard for the general public. Lest we dwell too long in the shadow of fear and Mordor, let us turn again toward the light of education. For despite some appearances, I am hopeful Welcome to the four part of the presentation. In a dark age with democratic structures and attentional capacity under duress, I am for scholarly associations and their members and leaders adapting to changing circumstances, shouldering responsibility for pedagogies that address our media limitations, and taking action to ensure that the light of education continues to shine brightly in a time of increasing darkness. First, some implications for learned societies of our evolving professoriate. We need to wake up, folks. A shifting labor market with a huge and growing proportion of contingent faculty, fewer and fewer tenure track lines, compounded by generational changes as millennials and Zoomers have different perspectives on work and careers. I think we need to really pay attention. I dislike hasty generationalizations, uh, especially with cohorts over 70 million or so, right? Um, but it is clear that each generation is increasingly diverse and is also further willing to disregard boomer and Gen X expectations and traditions. For learned societies to stay relevant to new generations of scholars and to retain a strong value proposition for membership, we must support, oops, Something went wrong, nope, there we go. There we go. We must first focus on member community experiences. Second, support resources for interaction and collaboration. And third, begin to integrate structural and perceptual concerns into organizational planning and action in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Membership and the value proposition will be called into question and rich community experiences, helpful resources to connect and engage with distributed scholarly groups, and an association committed to recognition, leadership roles, and fair access for scholars of color and other important groups will be critical for association survival. I offer two recommendations for curriculum focus and development, addressing both attention and polarization. First is a commitment to attention and mindfulness development. We should be in the business of helping students develop the cognitive control and focus they require to cope with a ubiquitous and tempting culture of distraction. Jackson notes that with training and a renaissance of attention, we don't have to settle for lives mired in detachment, fragmentation, and diffusion. Researchers long recognize that mindfulness practice increases focus, reduces stress and frustration, and enables more thoughtful and productive interaction. There are many strategies for mindfulness development, as evident in the tree of contemplation. Ghazali and Rosen conclude that meditation improves cognitive control, including positive effects on sustained attention, speed of processing, and working memory capacity. 
They also note other positive focus and attention training options, including specifically designed video games, cognitive exercises, and experiences in nature, all of which can develop greater executive control to strengthen goal management. The objectives of an education system should not be directed solely at the transfer of content to young minds, they claim. It should, quote, build strong cognitive control abilities that allow them to engage in dynamic and challenging environments. A mindfulness collaboratory started up at last year's NCA annual convention and finds many resonances between mindfulness and communication instruction. These learning practices don't have to be full courses, but can be what Kristen Blinney calls micro practices, quick ways for students to cope, or what I slyly call Jedi mind tricks. Okay, bear with me. Let's just stop for a moment and try something. Join me now in a meditative moment, if you will. Set aside some of the craziness of our day, still our media, center our bodies a little bit, if you can. And let's prepare for a wonderful evening and a safe journey home. I'm going to take three deep breaths, if we'd all do that together. In through the nose, out through the mouth, on a count of four each way, if you're comfortable in doing so. I name these breaths, release, center, and fresh. So we exhale first and then start. Are you with me? Release. I'm not hearing you. Center. Fresh. For further exploration, David Levy's Mindful Tech and Alex Pang's Distraction Addiction both offer step-by-step -step approaches to transforming relationship with technology. As another form of awareness and engagement, my final recommendation is that learned societies, faculty, and departments should support and use debate activities throughout the curriculum and at all levels of education. No, it shouldn't. And that's a cartoon. That sounds ridiculous. Yes, it should, because of widespread experience with lifelong benefits and hard research that shows that it fosters critical evaluation of claims and willingness to engage in discussion and dialogue. Huh, do you have any good examples? The clarity and excellent gun control advocacy by high school students from Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida is at least partly a reflection on Broward County's requirement of debate for high school, middle school, and now elementary school students. Well. That's only one area. Are there any nationwide examples? You could look at the urban debate leagues in 21 major cities across the country that have shaped tens of thousands of lives and proven that debate dramatically enhances academic performance and career prospects. All right, but do we know of any specific success stories? What do FDR, Nixon, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, Clinton, Oprah, Barbara Jarden, Margaret Thatcher, Janet Reno, Elizabeth Warren, Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X, Kofi Annan, and a large number of past NCA presidents all have in common? You guessed it, debate training and experience. Okay then, case closed. Uh, not quite. Debate does way more than just develop critical thinking. In Davis, Zorwick, Roland, and Wade's edited volume on using debate in the classroom, Carol Winkler presents strong evidence that debate fosters students' emotional behavior and cognitive engagement. It enhances emotional engagement by heightening enjoyment and interest in learning, reducing performance anxiety, reducing prejudice by increasing interactions between different peoples, and empowering youth as consumers and advocates. 
Debate increases behavioral engagement, such as persistence, concentration, and attention on learning tasks by increasing classroom participation, giving students optimism about their life and their future, and developing respect for the viewpoints of others. Finally, debate creates students' cognitive engagement, a desire to exceed requirements and elevate the level of their tasks to gain mastery by giving purpose and importance to research and reading tasks and by fostering engaging educational challenges. But are these recommendations really light for a dark age? There are no perfect solutions, but for me, debate matches closely the kind of skills needed in a world of fake news soundbite coverage, and hostility towards other environments, viewpoints. An activity that is adaptable across all disciplines, motivates learning, strengthens cognitive control with persistence and focus, and develops greater willingness to engage with others while also being critical of evidence and claims. Additionally, as a culture, if we begin to develop and value mindfulness practice and strengthen attention and executive control, our culture will become stronger and more resilient. We have arrived, mostly awake and alive, for five, our final exhortation. Reflectively, we follow our compelling traces of logos, including the examples and authoritative research on media cause and attention effects, the signs of democratic erosion in our discourse and vulnerabilities in our discursive environments, the provocative analogy between the scope of mind change and climate change and the principle of educational necessity for the development of control over distraction, of critical thinking and engagement over intolerance and hostility. And as we emerge, not in a moral panic, but charged with the sense of responsibility and purpose, alive and excited to be part of something that's bigger than any one of us, something critical, for those generations who inherit this perfect human storm of a beautiful and flawed world, we are now, finally, gratefully, lovingly, in conclusion. Here at the pinnacle, these sentences and their creator are very grateful for the honor and for the gift of your attention. Thank you.